It's good to, and I also want to welcome, welcome our guests today, our first time, first time visitors with us in the church. We welcome you. Thank you for coming and being part of what we do here at Pembroke Assembly of God. Uh, let's pray and get started in this morning's, this morning's uh, message. And I pray, I really do pray that God would impact your life today and really radically change you and draw you closer to Him. God, thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that it is forever settled in heaven. The grass will wither, the flowers will fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. God, we thank you for your word, the word of truth that anchors our life. God, let your spirit be present in everything that we do and say today, God. Uh, saturate our lives, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. Mark chapter 15. I'm just going to read a couple of verses of Scripture there and kind of have you bouncing around a little bit as... Uh, per the norm, it seems, but uh, verses 33 and 34 of Mark chapter 15, and I want to talk to you this morning about welcoming the Holy Spirit, welcoming the Holy Spirit in your life, in your family, in our church, in your life, in your family, um, at your places of business, uh, and just wherever, uh, wherever you might go. Um, I have had some incredible encounters uh, lately on the train, on my commute uh, into Boston uh, almost every day uh, with the Holy Spirit. And so much so um, that my conductor, Joe, uh, he was supposed to be here this morning. He promised me he would, but and he's not here. I don't see him, but I'm working on him, and hopefully he'll, he'll show up so, uh, soon. But uh, God... God um, the Holy Spirit wants to be welcome in your daily lives. There's a great scripture in the book of James, and I'm not going to go there, but look, up, look it up yourself. In the King James, it says, The Holy Spirit lusteth to envy, meaning the Holy Spirit kind of is a gentleman, and he kind of watches and he envies you, and watching you go about your daily life, without welcoming him, just waits on you to welcome him into your activities of your life. The Holy Spirit wants to conduct business and be part of everything that you do. If you believe that, say amen. You don't have to if you don't believe that. Amen. I believe it, so I say amen. Um, verse, verse 33 and 34, um, at noon, darkness came over the whole land, until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, or lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is not a um, Passion Week message leading up to the, the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I wanted to bring out this scripture to you. Um, these words, uh, <clears throat> Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Uh, really, the scholars have taken a look at uh, what Jesus said while hanging on the cross there. And that is their best that they could do to... Uh, interpret that portion of Scripture, um, many reasons why they left the original translation or the original verbiage in the Scripture was for that reason. Because at best, the, the translation is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you, if you noticed in verse uh, 33 of that same chapter, we talked about darkness coming over the land. And really what this speaks to me is that they were just about, they were close to, about to remove in their best attempt, Jesus from their life. And in removing Jesus from your life, you can be assured uh, that darkness will also fall over your land. Amen? In Matthew, the Bible accounts that also the ground shook beneath their feet and rocks split. In removing Jesus from your life, you can be sure that the ground underneath your feet will be unsteady as well. Amen? Amen. I, I know that. I know that. 
because I tried. It didn't work out too good for me. And in this portion of Scripture, um, a couple of things happen. So I just want to ask you a question. And this is not up for answer, so this is not Wednesday night. So please uh, hold comments. But the question I want to pose to your heart is, um, what killed Jesus? Was it the, uh, the blood, the lack of blood, uh, as he bled out through the rusty nails in his hands and his feet, or the spear that poked through his side? Was it the weight of the cross? And we know, like physically, we know that crucifixion takes away your breath because you can't get a good breath. And many of you know that. You, and, you, and you basically asphyxiate because you can't push yourself away from the cross long enough or hard enough to get a good breath. And, and so you, you die that way. But what killed our Lord? I, I, I want to kind of just put, put this out there for you. That it was partially that, but it was none of that. The first thing that had to happen for Jesus to give up the ghost was he had to stop speaking. Why do I know that? Why do we know that? Because the Bible says the words of God, Christ were God's words. They were life and they were spirit. Amen? Amen. They were life and they were spirit. They were truth. Everything he said was truth. What does the scripture say about truth? That truth sets you free. If he would have kept talking to the thief on the side of him, I don't believe he could have died. I don't believe that. If he would have continued talking and having this conversation with the Father, I don't believe. I believe he had to stop talking because his words had so much power and truth in him. It makes sense to me. And the other thing that happened, and I'm going to go back up to my notes, the other thing that happened was that Jesus gave up the ghost. The Bible says that, that uh, he who knew no sin became sin. That the sin of all mankind, yours and mine, laid upon him at that moment. And that the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, his, the Spirit's present, he gave up the ghost. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as the Spirit lifted from him? Two things in your life, if you speak the word, and you have the presence of God in your life, you will never die spiritually. You hear me? We're all going to die physically, but spiritually this church will never die if, we, if the Word of God goes forth and the Spirit of God is with us. Those two things, God's Word being spoken and, the, and His presence being in our life, this church will will never die. Amen. You will never die Everyone. spiritually you. with the Word of God and the presence of God in your life. That's a great place for an amen. amen. Yes, it is. That's a great place for one. And, and it was, and you did, and I'm glad. Amen. <laughs> but, but I want to look at... Um, The story of the story of Noah. And I'm talking about welcoming the Holy Spirit in your life. Welcoming the Holy Spirit in your family's lives. Welcoming the Holy Spirit here at our church. Welcoming his presence in our daily living. Amen. So important. And, and Noah, we know, um, was found righteous 
The Bible says that, that there was partying going on and reveling going on, a lot of sin. And God spoke to this righteous man, Noah, to build an ark. And we know, and you can read that in the first chapters of Genesis there, we know then that, that Noah was found faithful in that. He faithfully built the ark while he was being ridiculed and being snickered at by people that had not seen rain yet, that, that had not known why he was building this ark, but he was doing it because God told him to. He was being obedient to the voice of God. A key that locks in the presence of God in your life is obedience. Extreme obedience. If God speaks to you, obey Him. Obedience is better than? Oh, some of you guys have been reading your word. That's great. It is better than sacrifice. It is. Obedience. So Noah was obedient. And so they floated. The, the, the water came. The ground gave up its water. The rains came. The skies let loose its water. And all of a sudden, these people were looking at Noah like he wasn't crazy after all. Right? Now, people in the world will look at you like you're crazy sometimes. But, but and I don't wish the flood or that kind of tragedy to take place on the people around me. I want them all to be saved. But at some point, if you remain consistent and obedient to the call and the gift of God on your life, and you welcome the Holy Spirit in your life, the people around you will take notice. Maybe he's not crazy after all. Because I will tell you a story about my conductor. He would always see me with my headphones in my ears. Because I didn't want to listen to the chatter around me. The, I call them the cacklers. Everybody's cackling, cackling all around me. And I, and I was like having a hard time getting a hold of God. But I realized that I needed to be part of conversation. I was isolating. So I'm to be part of conversation. So one day, I wore my Teen Challenge and Addiction shirt on the train. And it caught my conductor's eye. And he started talking with me. Next thing I know, he's got a loved one in his family that's really struggling with addiction. Next thing I know, Nola Jean and I are going out to dinner with the conductor and this person that was struggling with addiction. During dinner, I had the opportunity to talk to them about what makes Teen Challenge different than other organizations, and I told them about God and about the Holy Spirit. And about how Jesus Christ sits in the middle of every single thing that we do. Next thing I know, his loved one is away getting help. Today, his loved one is away getting help. Yeah. The people around you will begin to ask questions and they will take note that just like the, the unlearned, uneducated disciples, apostles, they took note that they were in the presence of God. Amen. Not with eloquence of speech, but with the power of the Holy Spirit tempering your words. Amen? Amen. The presence of God. And so here's Noah. The rains come, the ground begins to bubble up its water, the boat is filled with, and you guys know the story, all the way from way back in Sunday school classes, they loaded the ark with the animals, and the ark floated off. And it was time now for brand new life. The rain had stopped, the ground had been give, stopped giving. Read it in the 8th chapter of the book of Genesis. You can read it there. Noah, at the end of more than 40 days, it was more like 150 days of being locked up in the, in the ark, releases a couple of birds. He pops open the window for the very first time. Get the picture with me? He pops open the window. The first bird he releases is a raven. He releases the raven. And now, now, in my mind, a raven is one of those nasty kind of vulture birds 
that hang out along the side of the road eating the roadkill? You know, you know what kind of bird I'm talking about? They're just crows, just flesh eaters, right? So the raven, the Bible says, never came back. Never came back to the ark. The Bible says then he released the dove. The dove, the dove flew off. The Bible says that the dove had no place to set the soles of her feet. So she came back to the hands of Noah. The Bible says that Noah reached out his hands and he took back to himself this dove. The dove, we know, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when Jesus was baptized in water, a dove lighted on him and remained with him. You ever been close to a dove? Like in my yard, I have a couple doves. I'm very grateful. We have lots of birds, but we have only a couple doves. And what I've noticed about the doves are that they're real flighty. They're, they're, it doesn't take much for them to fly off. In fact, we have a couple bird feeders. They won't even land on the bird feeder because there's too much activity there. I don't know why. But they just kind of fly off when I get close to them. Yeah, well, amen. They're flighty, though. And the Bible says, and I can picture, now, now, now get the picture of this raven. Let's go back to the raven. I'm going to talk more about the dove to you. But the raven, I can imagine when it went out uh, and the window opened and he took in his first breath of whatever was outside that ark, it smelt good to him. The bloated carcasses of dead animals. Roadkill. Road Whatever remains were out there floating on the tops of the waves. That the raven found it pleasing to hang out on top of that stuff. Now this is just how I think. But the Bible says that the dove had no place to put her feet. I submit to you this morning that we need clean hands, a pure heart, and dove's feet in order to welcome and continually welcome and have visitation and habitation of the Holy Spirit in our life. Amen. That God, there's more. Not legalistically but continually welcoming Him. There, you know, and I talk about this the last couple of weeks, repentance is a gift. You knew that, right? We don't talk about it often. But repentance is a gift. It's a gift of repentance. It's a good thing to feel conviction from God. We want, I want the Holy Spirit in my life, not just to bless me, not just so that I could feel good and have goosebumps running up and down my arms. Not just so that we can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. Not just so that we can lay hands and blind eyes open. Not just for that. But I want the blessing and the blistering of the Holy Spirit in my life. God's Holy Spirit will bring conviction to your heart. When is the last time, really? And I'm, 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 I had to ask this question myself, and I'm going to ask it to you. That you really were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit in a service like this, where God just spoke to you and said, Man, I've been, I got some things that I've been thinking about I shouldn't be thinking about. I got some things that I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing. There's some activity of my heart that, does, that shouldn't be taking place. Not in an angry way, but a loving, soft, gentle, because it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Not the angry, harsh, hard words of God, but the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. When is the last time that has happened to you? This is pretty good preaching, I think. Amen. 
Last week, my wife said, you were yelling up there, Frank. I heard you down there with the children. I said, I don't know any other way. The teachers tell it and preachers yell it. I don't know how to do it any other way. I'm sorry if I'm like, too loud for you, but I'm, I'm trying. I just get so excited and passionate about God and about what God has for us as a church. That, and listen. The dove came back to the hands that protected it. There was something about Noah that knew how to welcome the dove back into his life. That the dove felt like, yes, let me land on his hands. Let me come back and spend more time with him. I want that in my life. I want that kind of life before God where God's Holy Spirit longs to spend time with me. With me, not just me, longing to spend time with Him. And He wants to spend time with me. And the second time He released them, the Bible says the dove flew around and came back with an olive branch in its mouth. Now there are a couple Bible scholars in here. I know there are. But did you know that that's where we get the precious anointing oil from? Partially, the oil from the olive tree. So maybe God was speaking to us that if we welcome and have a place to welcome the Holy Spirit... God's anointing will come with that and there will be anointing in your words and anointing on the things that you say and the atmosphere in which you live will change because the words are anointed of God because you had no place to put your feet in the filth of the world. No, 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 you do know that I preached this message to me before I do it to you. So I'm, I'm right with you. Let me, I mean, if it was possible. <laughs> if it was possible, I would do both. Because I need this in my life. I need this in my life. I want our church to be a place that welcomes the Holy Spirit. I want you. Now look, that dove didn't just come back to Noah, but the dove came back to Noah's family. This is bigger than just you. Bigger than just you. There's another portion of Scripture in Luke chapter 22. And we're going to shift away from Noah. And um, this is where Peter, the great apostle Peter, you know he's a great apostle, on the revelation of Christ, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it on that revelation that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Shortly after that, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for another reason, but he did have the revelation that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God, Peter, and he was told by Jesus that he was going to deny him. Before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. No, 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 not me. I'll never deny you. Read it. I'll never deny you. Yeah, yeah, not me. I'll... They might, those, those people, those men, yeah. Those dudes, they'll deny you, but not me. I mean, I'm Peter, I'm the rock. Don't you know who you're talking to right now? Jesus? Well, you forgot that I know who you are? He said, no, you're going to deny me. And what did Peter do? 
Because the words of Christ are true. Peter denied Jesus and denied Jesus and denied Jesus again. And if that weren't bad enough, I just want to play this tape out a little bit more for you. If that's okay with you. Is it okay? Okay. So, Jesus said, hey, listen, when I, when I return, when you return, strengthen your brothers. I'm going to pray that your faith will not fail you. When you return, strengthen your brothers. He spoke that to Peter. So Jesus knew that he was going to make a comeback. He did. A righteous man falls seven times but gets back up again. Can you say amen? amen. That's right. It's not about how many times you fall. It's about how many times you get back up. And us as men and women of God, we should have a hand down like that, right? Now look at that, brother. He fell. Isn't that what we do? I don't. Get back up here, boy. God's got a plan for your life. That's the mercy and grace of God. But I can imagine Peter... Every morning, we have, and my son and my, my daughter-in-law are here, my little, my little grandbaby, I'm so grateful. But they could tell you that my neighbors are neighbors. We live in a two-family home. They live in one house. I live in the next. My neighbors have roosters. Yeah, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Wait, it's great. My neighbors have roosters. And they have like the little hens that go with the rooster. They kind of need to look at, but I really don't like them in my yard anymore. The novelty wore off, all right? <laughs> For a day or two, it was great. But every morning, if you get up early enough, and most of the time I do, you hear. <laughs> I even, hey, listen, you know, you know how silly I am. No, I'm going to. No, I did some. Wait, I want to show you. I want to show you. I mean, I downloaded a rooster app on my phone. I did. You hear that? Wait, let me turn it up. Let me turn it up. Hold on. Here it is. I mean, some of these get kind of crazy. Oh, I hit the wrong button. But anyways, as you can imagine, I had, I had kind of fun with that. But you know, here's... I mean, I've heard them all since October. I've heard every one of those. But because I have, I had a revelation and a realization that so did Peter. Now, now I'm taking this somewhere. He heard it once. He heard it twice. He heard it three times. Yes, the word of God is true. But how about every single morning when he got up, everybody out there raised chickens. Every single morning, he would hear that God-awful sound. Oh, Lord. Neighbors, if you're watching this, I do love your chickens. I love you. Just... <laughs> but every time he woke up in the morning, he felt condemned because of his past mistakes. He heard the sound over and over again. And I got a feeling there's some people in this room just like that. And over and over again, I mean, I don't know who it is, it's somebody, something reminds you of where you should be and you're not because of some of the things that you did. You yourself sometimes beat yourself up. The, the Bible says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. For those who walk not after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit, there is no condemnation in God. 
but yet we have a tendency to condemn ourselves. And I can imagine Peter feeling condemned over and over and over again every time he heard the rooster crow. But God, I'm, I'm, getting, some, I'm getting somewhere. I'm going somewhere. If you go over to Acts chapter 2, you will see That's supposed to say Acts chapter 2, John. I'm sorry. Acts chapter 2. They all waited in the upper room. Right? They waited in the upper room to be endued with power. And the Bible says, let me turn to it. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from the heaven, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. What came? A sound came. A sound from heaven. A sound of a mighty rushing wind. The sound that drowned out the rooster. Now it ain't going to work. The sound of the rooster. Yes, God. <laughs> <laughs> The sound of the mighty rushing wind filled that house, filled that room. And the sound of the rooster, the sound of condemnation, the sound of, 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 of just being stuck in the failures of your past was washed away and drawn away by the sound of heaven. Amen. And Peter stepped out that day and said, hey, listen, they're not drunk as you suppose. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, 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 I have to submit to you, why was Peter able to explain all that and he wasn't walking around speaking in tongues? I don't have the answer to that. Something happened different to Peter than it did the rest of the men. He was able to explain it. But nevertheless, he walked down the street, and I can see him walking down the street from that moment when he got ready to preach to 3,000 people and they got saved. And I can just see the rooster coming to visit him one more time. Ah! But not this time. Not this time. Because the sound of heaven washed away the sound of the condemning voices of his past. That, my friends, is powerful. That is powerful. God Give us clean hands, a pure heart, and dove's feet. Holy Spirit, come. In Exodus chapter 33, somewhere right in there, uh, it was just directly after, um, I mean, no, Moses had many visitations with God. But God was so upset with them, the children of Israel, worshiping a golden calf and idols, that he said, look, my promises will go with you, my word will go with you, but I'm not going with you. 
Read it. I'm not going with you. And with two and a half million people behind him, Moses stopped and hit the brakes and said, Look, God, your promises are great. I'm, glad, I'm grateful for your word. But if your presence doesn't go with us, I'm not going anywhere. We are not going unless your presence goes before us, God. And God, that's my prayer this morning. God's Spirit, God's anointing, God's presence will bring the increase to our church. Do you believe that? Oh, it will. It will. I promise you it will. Jacob got into the presence of God's, God. He got into God's presence, angels going up and down, ascending, descending. And pretty soon Jacob said, listen, God, I'll give you a tenth of everything that I have. God never mentioned that to him. God never told him to start tithing. God's presence did that to Jacob. He said, I'll start giving to you, God, 10% of everything. God, His presence will bring the increase in our lives, in our church, in our family. I am convinced that we cannot have too much of God's Spirit and presence in our life. But I am also convinced that we can have too little. We can have too little. I mean, I'll, I'll take the crumbs from under the master's table. That's okay with me. But I'd rather have the whole loaf. <laughs> there must be more, and there is more. Will you pray with me that God will begin to move that way in our church? that we would be a place that welcomes the presence of God, that place that welcomes His voice, that drowns out the condemning voices in our head and our heart, that we, because as a church family and as men and women of God, we don't find desire to put our feet in places where they don't belong. Because God says the steps of good men are ordered of the Lord and He delights in your way. Will you pray with me that in the days to come that God's Spirit will begin to move in such a powerful way that we will welcome the movement and the usher in presence of God like we've never experienced before. God, bless your people, I pray. Thank you, God, for the examples in your word. Thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I'm hungry for revival. Not just so people can be healed, but so people can be delivered, set free, not just for those reasons. But Lord, a revival that will bring salvation. To, into the lives of those that have been struggling, bound up, broken, condemned, self-condemned. But that kind of move of God here on this campus. that we will welcome that, God, welcome you. 
in Jesus' name. Listen, folks. The woman with the issue of blood, I've heard it taught a bazillion times, and that's not even a word. I realize that, but a lot of times. And I've heard it taught right, and I've heard it taught wrong, and I probably have taught it right and taught it wrong myself. I'm human. I don't always get it right. I try real hard, especially when it comes to God's word and his truth. But I may have even said in my own dealings with Scripture that she reached out and touched God, but she never did touch God, right? She never touched Jesus. She touched the hem of his garment, right? We know that. So she touched what touched Jesus. <laughs> I want to touch Jesus. I want to touch him. Not just for me. I want to touch Jesus because I want people to touch me and I touch Jesus and then they receive what the woman of, with the issue of blood received. Why? Because I spent time with Jesus. Touch him to touch them. You get it? Touch him for them. Not just for you. For them. There's so many thems out there marching their way to a devil's hell. To touch him for them. God, make it happen. Send revival, Lord. Send revival. Yes. Yes, start with me. Start with me, God. And let that be the cry of our heart this morning. So that we could touch you, not just for us. That's part of it. I'm grateful. But touch you for them. For them. Listen, uh, I'm going to wrap this up, but many people, when Jesus touched them, they were healed. That's great, right? That's awesome. They were healed. Jesus touched. They were healed. But this woman with the issue of blood, the Bible says, that touched him, touched the hem, touched what touched him, was made whole. She wasn't just healed. She was made whole. It was like more than just the healing. She was made whole. How important is it for us to touch him? It's not too late. This is just getting started. We're only just, we've only just begun. Yeah, amen. God, go with your people. Bless them, I pray. I pray, Holy Spirit, God, that you would be welcomed into our cars when we leave here, into our homes, when we get there, into our places of work. God, when we arrive there tomorrow morning on the golf course, if we're retired and we get to do that, God, God, come with us. We pray, Holy Spirit, don't just take, have visitation, but take up habitation in our life. Amen. And we believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. If you